Hello, I'm Ali Hosseini, uh, co-director of National Gallery X, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this uh, second installment of Art and Flux at National Gallery X. First, I'd like to welcome our audience, and then I'd like to welcome Art and Flux, who have played quite a role in National Gallery X. Um, we launched a year ago, and our goal was to start looking at how art and science can impact each other. National Gallery X is a, is a partnership between King's College London and the National Gallery. And uh, we're looking at art in the future. I don't 
think that this event could have happened at a more poignant time. Um, you know, this event is about transformations, and we are right in the midst of vast social transformations uh, having to do with COVID, but more, more basically and more fundamentally having to do with humanity's relationship to nature and to self. And if we, if we look at art as a way of understanding ourselves and understanding ourselves in nature, then this is very, very, um, this is a significant issue that we need to address. And I, I'm thinking all the way back to cave paintings, which were somehow an attempt for humanity to place themselves in the world and to understand themselves in the world. So let's go into this event. I'll, I'll hand this off to uh, Maria Mena to show us some of the cave paintings of today. Thanks, Maria. Thanks, uh, participants. And thanks especially to all of the audience for coming. Thank you very much, Ali. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Maria Almena, and I'm a curator and co-founder of Art in Flux. I'm delighted to be here at this event in collaboration with National Gallery X. A welcome to, to uh, all of you to Levitations, an exploration of transformative media art experiences. An event curated by myself, exploring how contemporary artists and scientists are using technology to create transformative experiences for the future of humanity's well-being. Before going ahead with the event, I would like to briefly introduce myself, our organization, and also some housekeeping tips. I'm Spanish London-based multidisciplinary artist, creative director of the Studio Quimatica, as well as curator for Art in Flux. My art practice explores concept of human consciousness and perception, making those transcendental ideas accessible to a modern audience, to inspire reconnection with the magical thinking and the ethereal world. I explore the crossover between the physical and spiritual, the virtual and real, the scientific and the artistic, and contemporary and ancestral rituals. I mainly create interactive installation and new media performance, always with a holistic therapeutic approach. Art in Flux was founded in 2016, a light of Soho gallery in London, by the artists Oliver Gingrich, Afra Semsa, and myself. We are a charitable organization committed to furthering further the development of the media arts community in the UK. As an artist-led forum, we offer a space for collaboration and exchange as key artists and organizations come together to profile their work. The best way to view the event is by activating the active speaker mode, which you can find on the top left corner, the blue bottom in the middle that shows on the screen. We encourage audience participation through questions via the Q&A window. At the end of the event, we'll have an open Q&A session, including a few selected questions from the Q&A window. So please, please feel free to use it. We'll also be sharing some relevant links on the chat throughout the event, so do keep an eye on it. There will be some strobe lights from one of the demos, but this will be announced right before it happens. And you will also need headphones for one of the other demos, so please have them close to you if you can. We wanted to mention that we are recording the event, now, I'm going to leave you with my colleagues, Afra and Oliver, who are going to share some of the key aspects from Art in Flux. Thank you, Maria. It is such a delight to be here with you all this evening, and I cannot wait to hear from the speakers. My name is Afra Shemza. I'm a multimedia artist working with light, abstraction, and interactivity. I combine traditional sculpting techniques with the latest technology to create my pieces. My keen interest in modernism, my Islamic cultural heritage, and creating art for all are all central themes within my practice. Art in Flux was founded in 2016 by artists for artists. We have grown from a loose forum of around 30 artists to a group of over 2000 plus practicing artists, all working on the intersection of art and technology. With Art in Flux, we have created a platform for media artists to work with institutions. So far, we have worked with the V&A Museum and National Gallery X, and many universities such as Goldsmiths and the Royal College of Art. This year, we had the pleasure of collaborating with Ars Electronica Festival for the first time, which is one of the biggest media arts festivals in the world. We run many different types of events over the course of the year. Our Flux socials are key to our organization as they provide a forum for collaboration and the exchange of ideas as artists come together in a peer-led environment. 
Our larger curated talks events allow us to bring key themes from our media arts community to the general public. As we and all of our community are artists, it was a natural progression for us to curate and organize our own exhibitions. They feature an array of creative practices and new technologies such as VR, AI, real-time data visualization and live body mapping to name but a few. We don't want our art practices to be exclusive so in 2018, we began our community workshops, which provide an opportunity for the general public to learn more about the techniques we use to make our work and also even become artists themselves. I will now hand over to my colleague, Oliver Gingrich, who will talk a bit further about our Flux virtual offering. Thank you, Afra, and thank you to the National Gallery X for hosting us. My name is Oliver Gingrich. I'm a new media artist, a researcher at the National Center for Computer Animation, and curator and co-founder of Art in Flux. Here you can see some images of my practice. With the Arts Collective and the Lemma Group, I'm creating immersive visual sound experiences. And my own practice centers around neuroart and presence, often using holographic displays. Over the last six months, thanks to the support of the Arts Council England, we moved all of our programming online. Our monthly socials continue to bring the UK media arts community together, which now feels more important than ever. Our Flux Lives are public facing events, showcasing live demos and conversations. You can watch all of them on our Art and Flux YouTube channel, including our latest one, Flux Autonomy, curated by Maria Almena, which formed part of the Irish Electronica Festival. In addition, we're very proud to have started a new collaboration with National Gallery X this year, our first event at NGX, Gender Tech, was curated by myself and focused on media art and gender. Together with a virtual exhibition, Gender Tech is now online on the Art in Flux and National Gallery websites. Tonight's event, Levitations, forms part of the series and is curated by Art in Flux co-founder, Maria Almena. Maria, back over to you. Thank you, Oliver. We are now ready to start with Levitations, an online event exploring transformative media art experiences. Humans have always pursued transformative experiences consistently through our known history. However, only recently, there has been resurgence mainly through research in psychotherapy, neuroscience, attempting to better understand the processes behind these experiences, how to create them, what is their effect, and could they have a positive impact? In this evening of immersive existential inquiries, Levitations will explore how media artists, scientists, and researchers are creating experiences using technology with the intention of transforming our society. Can media art experiences have a positive impact on our body, mind, and our society as a whole? Can these artistic experiences help us to levitate into a better future? In this occasion, the title Levitations is referring to how a work of art can enable one to be transported going beyond the given limits, aiming to inspire human transformation. I selected two images from contemporary artists, Larissa Moiseiva and Asuma Makoto, who are exploring the concept of levitation or in their work. I've chosen this theme as it is very close to my heart, but I also believe it's very relevant right now. We are living in a world full of progress and abundance, but there is also so much suffering, and the issues on physical and mental health keep increasing. Particularly after COVID, mental health organizations have seen an increase of 30%. Taking this into account, I believe contemporary artists have the responsibility to answer to our society needs and use the power of the arts to be an activator for social change. We also need to do further research in order to find contemporary therapies that can be more suitable for the new ways of being and living in our current society. Art therapy has existed for many years and it has proven to have a positive impact. It is a form of psychotherapy that uses art as its primary mode of expression and communication, using the creative process to improve the, and enhance the physical, mental, and emotional well being. I selected two of my favorite female artists that use the creative process as a therapeutic tool Louise Bourgeois and Tracy Emin. The British artist Adrian Hill coined the term art therapy in 1942. He wrote that the value of art therapy lay in completely engrossing the mind, as well as the fingers, releasing the creative energy of the frequently inhibited patient, which enabled the patient to build up, to build up a strong defense against his misfortunes. 
1945, he wrote his book, Art versus Illness. Edward Adamson, the father of art and therapy in, in Britain, joined Adrian Hill to extend Hill's work. And in 1964, the British Association of Art Therapies was founded. Art therapy institutions exist in many countries around the world too, and the international network contributes to the establishment of standards of education and practice. We are living very unique times where artists and scientists are collaborating more than ever. They are both exploring how technology can serve them as a new technique for their research. Taking into account the similarities between the creative and scientific process, I truly believe that by combining the best of both worlds, we can achieve breakthroughs in the future of well-being. Some successful examples of this collaboration I would like to mention are the overview effect by Dr. Anahita Nesami and Isness by David Glovoki. I am fascinated with the transformative power of the arts. As an artist, I've always used my creative process as a therapeutic tool, but this was always done in a subconscious process. In the last few years, I was forced to look into, into this deeper due to a chronic health condition. So I decided to make a conscious effort to combine these two processes. Through my curatorial research, I observed how many other media artists were researching these two. So I concluded that this will be my creative focus for the years to come, as I believe this could be beneficial for our society too. For this event, I've been researching how impressionist artists are related to media artists as artists from both periods were, were and are the true innovators of our times. I was particularly drawn to abstract impressionism. Artists from this period were the first ones to observe that nothing was permanent and that they were, in, they were inspired to represent the constant motion and transformation in light and color. A common subject in media arts as seen with James Tarrell, for example. Another innovation from impressionism is that the viewer was not merely passive anymore having to actively work to find the meaning of the piece. They need to interpret the artist's view. I relate this to participatory media arts as the audience needs to be actively engaged in creating the art piece. And therefore, they need to find the meaning and intention behind in order to understand it. There were also many scientific discoveries on visual perception during, during Impressionism, which serves as a huge source of inspiration for the Impressionist artists. Currently, Neuroscience is informing many, many media art practice too, as this sign can now measure the intensity or effect in any of the experiences art can create. This opens new opportunities where the art experiences can be validated by the scientific method. Neuroscience also offers the possibilities of creating personalized experiences to each individual, using EGG devices to abstract data and using neurofeedback as a therapeutic technique. This has been successfully used by neuroscientists such as Heather Hargraves in Canada and the studio NeoArts in Portugal. I was particularly interested in the abstract pieces from Monet, such as Water Lilies. I learned, thanks to the impressionist curator from the National Gallery, Christopher Riopel, that he was one of the first ones to explore immersion by scaling up his art pieces with the intention of immersing the audience into his work. Creating immersive experiences is a key tendency of new media arts, and it is fascinating to see how much the art world has evolved in this matter. And it is particularly important when trying to achieve a transformative or therapeutic effect. For this evening, I selected some of my favorite artists and scientists who are using technology to create transformative experiences. I selected practitioners that use different mediums in order to offer an overview of what is possible with each medium. I also wanted to mainly feature female artists to balance our fair representation in this industry. I am very excited to introduce you to all the speakers who will take part in Levitations. Mendel Kellen, neuroscientist focused on sound therapy. Rachel Winfield, designer of immersive installations. Kimatica Studio, creators of transcendental performative experiences. Natasha Trotman, a neurodiverse artist and inclusive designer. Luciana Hale, an artist focused on light therapy. Now, with a further ado, I would like to introduce you to our first speaker. Mandel Kellen is the founder of WavePaths, a project that has that developed the methods and protocols for the use of music to enhance therapy outcomes. 
This evening, he's going to present a live generated music demo and a talk that will explore the relationship of music and altered state of consciousness and the unique role for artists in redefining mental health care in our society. Let's all welcome Mendel Kellen. Thank you, Maria, for that amazing introduction. And thank you, Ali, Afra, Oliver, and everyone else for all inviting me to speak here at this really interesting conference um, alongside these really interesting speakers. I'm really looking forward to hear the other presentations after me. Um, yeah, so my name is Mendel. I am a neuroscientist by training. I founded Wave Paths in 2019. Um, you can find me and us on Twitter. You can also email us at wave at wavepaths.com and find my information on our website. Um, I'm gonna start quickly because I have not that much time to try to unpack a very multi-layered uh, set, uh, set of ideas. And um, I really would love to demo and, and, and present some music as well. So make sure that you have your headphones available for this experience. And if everyone has trouble hearing me, please let me know because there are some recent issues with my laptop and with my, with my microphone. Um, okay, so one of the main things in my career that I'm interested in is this question, how a better future of mental health care may look like. And the more I looked into this, uh, this question, the more I, um, I like to phrase this differently and um, really remind all of us that we are essentially concerned with understanding how to facilitate change or how to facilitate how um, Ali in his uh, introduction uh, talked about how to facilitate a deeper understanding of ourselves, how to facilitate a deeper, more constructive connection with ourselves and not only ourselves, but also with others in the world around us. And that's a deep question. And um, I'm not gonna pose uh, that I have the answer to that, but through my research with psychedelics and music, I, um, I, one of the conclusions that we are drawing is that one thing seems to be very clear, and that is that the future of mental health care will be more experiential as we know it. And this, um, this question, how we can facilitate experiences as medicine, experiences as the foundation for change, is really the core focus of my research and my work. And I will unpack the, all of these statements for you over the coming few minutes. And before I do that, I'd like to say thank you to the amazing team of beautiful people that has gathered around this vision since 2019. Um, we have uh, technologists, artists, researchers, um, all together to, um, to be with nothing less or more concerned than trying to understand how we can facilitate true life changing experiences to people. And when we talk about experience as medicine, um, one of um, the ways we talk about artists as, is as masters of experience. If this is the future of mental health care, or is, if this is a really important component of the future of mental health care, the, uh, the capacity to facilitate experiences as medicine, we need to work together with the masters of experience, the artists, the architects, the designers, the psychotherapists, um, everyone concerned with understanding experience and try to unify that knowledge and those insights into one uh, model that is facilitating these, these experiences to people and making them more widely accessible. Here are some of the artists that we are engaging with. And in fact, as we are speaking, we are currently actively onboarding more artists um, to our platform, which is very exciting. Um, this is one of our core objectives to summarize, is to scientifically study and develop the most optimal environments for psychedelic therapy and beyond psychedelic therapy. And I'll again explain what I mean with this. And to make sure that we provide tools that are highly accessible to enhance therapy outcomes and therapy experiences, both for care providers and for care seekers. In other words, how do we understand and how do we develop um, experiences as medicine? Our current studies focus on understanding the functions of music, how to personalize music, how to facilitate psychedelic experiences with music and psychedelic in a real meaning of the word psychedelic derived from the Greek meaning soul revealing or mind revealing and understanding what other contextual variables are important as well, such as light, interpersonal elements, smell and others. Um, we have an active research program that is running. We have uh, since January supported more than 600 patient experiences and we are um, working on more than 10 clinical trials as we speak with a range of different universities around the world. And over the coming 10 minutes, I will try to give you um, an overview very briefly over uh, our insights so far. This slide needs very little um, introduction. I'm gonna 
kind of skim over this really briefly, mental health care desperately needs innovation. Mental health problems are very prevalent and the current treatments available are way too ineffective for way too many people. And, and there's a lot of interest recently in psychedelic therapy involving psilocybin, the active ingredient of magic mushrooms, for example, but also LSD and MDMA in these uh, therapeutic environments. And what I always like to emphasize is that a lot of really important work already happened in the 50s, the 60s, but that wave crashed in the 70s. And um, it, to my opinion, primarily because of uh, political reasons. But there has been a lot of really important research that happened over the last decade or so that is demonstrating that these psychedelic compounds can be safe and effective. And I like to emphasize, can be safe and effective to treat some very debilitating conditions like depression, uh, trauma, addiction, and others. And what is very interesting when you look into these studies um, and what really baffled a lot of researchers like myself is that you can um, give this drug, give this medicine once or twice or a few number of occasions. The effects are immediate, um, symptoms go down immediately, and often they sustain for months and years. And rightly so, there's more funding being poured into this uh, community as we speak. Now, one of the most commonly reported findings in studies around the world is that patients undergoing these experiences refer to these experiences as one of the most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. And I just like everyone to absorb that for a moment because that's, that's quite something to say. And many of these studies show that actually um, these are not just drug experiences that facilitate improvements. These drugs can facilitate a lot of different kinds of experiences, but there are certain experiences that are related to these positive therapy outcomes. So this is not real data, just to illustrate a point, but this is um, a consistent finding across different studies that show that the more personally meaningful the experience is, the more people report, for example, peak experiences, the more effective the therapy outcomes seem to be. In my research, when I looked into this, I came to the conclusion that actually there's nothing really mysterious going on here, that actually this finding has very solid foundations in the neuroscience of human development. Very briefly, our brain can be divided in two different learning systems or two different memory systems, if you wish. One is concerned with explicit learning, semantic knowledge, symbolic knowledge, recalling memories from the past, episodes from the past. The other learning system has to do with implicit um, experiences such as procedural learning, conditioning, and priming. Um, an example I often use to explain this is riding a bicycle, learning how to ride a bicycle. You can only learn how to ride a bicycle by riding a bicycle. There are certain things you only learn by actively engaging in it and experiencing um, the, the skill at hand. Um, and this implicit, um, which literally means learning by experiencing, is understood to drive these subconscious memory formations, but that determine a lot of our perceptions and behaviors. And this is a really well studied phenomena in neuroscience. In fact, um, famous neuroscientist Eric Kendall won the Nobel Prize to identify this mechanism. Now, what does that have to do with um, psychedelic therapy? Um, the emotional system is one of the strongest learning systems in the brain, and it's fully implicit. And this is one explanation why experiences that have strong personal significance lead to strong changes in personality, identity, the way we perceive ourselves, the way we relate to ourselves, and so forth and so on. And the only thing I'm trying to do here is give people a framework, a new framework to look at this new form of therapy called psychedelic therapy as providing an opportunity for implicit learning experiences to happen. Um, it represents therefore a very different paradigm of care. We cannot just give these drugs to people and expect them to be better. And we are, and we are actively concerned with understanding how we can facilitate the change through tapping into literally the core um, um, in, our, in our brain where learning and change is literally programmed to happen. And another really important question is to this field is how to guide all the states of consciousness. Because these are not um, ordinary experiences. These are often very powerful experiences and it requires a, a whole new um, community of therapists that learn how to not only be psychotherapists, but also how to facilitate and guide people through these very um, sometimes intense and dramatic states of consciousness. So the greatest promise that it's a different paradigm of care also at the same time represents a very important challenge. Okay, I'm gonna be a little bit quicker here because I'm only have five minutes left and I wanna present some music as well. Um, in my work, I 
in this image you see, by the way, let's go back one, one, one slide. Um, the main emphasis here is that psychedelic therapy is no magic pill. And that in order to facilitate these experiences, we are understanding that these context variables in which these uh, medicines are given are absolutely essential to get right. And my career began when I looked at an image like this, not exactly this image, um, which is an image of psychedelic therapy in this case with MDMA, where a patient receives the medicine in this interpersonal framework where you have a psychotherapeutic relationship. But during the session itself, the patients listen to music with headphones and with an eye mask. Eye masks are tools to guide the attention fully inwards and the music is almost the only stimulus present during these altered states of consciousness. So I started to back the question, if we want to understand what's happening in this form of therapy, we need to understand, we need to look at the interaction between the drug and the music. And I'm gonna give you a very bird eye view perspective on music of psychedelics. I'm gonna skip some of these slides. The main thing I'm gonna show here is how incredibly fascinating the history of psychedelics and music is, how intertwined they have been for literally tens of thousands of years, and how music and psychedelics are still part of many traditional ceremonies around the world. Um, I'm going to actually skip these slides because I want to make sure I don't rush into the music experience for you. Um, if anyone is interested in my scientific research, you can um, Google my name um, or look at Google Scholar and you'll find a lot of these, these, these papers. Um, now, what is um, the case here? Um, psychedelic therapy is complex and new. Music is very complex. Human beings are very complex, so the human mind is very complex. And this is where I realized there's an opportunity to bring together knowledge from neuroscience, psychotherapy research, the immersive arts and creative AI or computational creativity into one framework. And we have embedded this into this adaptive music technology. We have um, first piloted this last year in London. We worked together with a group of artists and we created this space that combined light and music with one room with 21 speakers and one subwoofer for uh, one individual to really uh, and ask ourselves how far we can go with giving people really powerful immersive experiences. And we got some meaningful scientific data here um, that actually demonstrated the same phenomena. People uh, had these peak experiences and the degree to which it happened correlated with improvements in well-being afterwards as well. Now again, there's a lot more to say here, some visual impressions of that experience. And what I want to do now in the final few minutes is give you a very um, um, very um, brief overview about what we've built so far. I think you've seen my screen right now. So the team that you just saw um, has done a lot of interesting and, and amazing things. But one of the things we have done earlier this year is not only built this fully generative, adaptive, responsive music system, but also managed to make it work on the cloud, on the internet completely. So I'm going to give you all a link. I'm going to give a super brief demo. Normally, I never do it in such little time. I actually ask people to at least reserve one hour for this experience. Um, but if anyone, anyone is interested in that longer experience, please um, sign up to our newsletter and you will have access very soon to our bad app product, which will be released later this year. Um, you'll see I'm just putting in some variables here for the experience. Um, and I'm going to give you a link. This is usually the interface for therapists to work with. There's much more, I skipped a lot of things, but there's much, much more that happens here. Usually you can select the medicine, the dose of the medicine, a lot of different things. I'm gonna give you all a link right now in Zoom. And at least if I can find my Zoom, there we go, chat. The link, please click on the link, um, click join the session. Um, and complete some of the variables that you see there. And then um, you will hear some music emerging through your headphones. And I'll go back to my screen. And what I'm gonna illustrate to you is basically a few of the many therapeutic mechanisms that we have integrated in technology. So we have identified different functions of music, first of all. But then within these functions, we can um, control the different musical variables, the different musical instruments, and we can also 
um, control the musical complexity. So as you saw, I just clicked on level four out of one and you will within 30 seconds or so gradually hear the music change from being quite minimal to being a bit more rich. I see people coming in right now, so I'm actually going to do that again for people that are just joining. I'm going to change the music as well for a new experience and just allow people to come in. There's... I'm going to then, out of respect for time, gradually wrap this up as well within a minute or so. So I'll just emphasize all the music you can hear are building blocks, not compositions, but phrases, melodies, bits of instruments delivered by some of the musicians that you saw in the beginning of these slides. And our system is able to tag these sound files that come in and then blend them together in real time into a unique composition for each person. And because we are literally expanding our uh, library on a daily and weekly basis, the amount of possibilities is exponentially exploding. And this is very useful because we are at the same time studying what personalization elements we want to think about, what kind of acoustic qualities someone is likely to respond to, what kind of instruments someone is likely to respond to. And then within these sessions, that can also be linked up with biometric hardware, by the way, we have control over Again, a lot of these different variables. And we're going to go one more time from the lower level of complexity to the highest. And you hear within 20 seconds the music changing again. And then I'm going to respectfully end the session and give the floor back to Maria and the team. And again, if any one of you want to hear more of this, uh, go to our website and uh, you, can, you can sign up. I'm going to end the music right now. It will gradually end in about 20 seconds. And after the music ended, you can go back to the um, Zoom link. And we'll wrap this up. Our mission is to look really deeply into altered states of consciousness and what the archetypal instrument has been for shamanism through the ages, we believe that our age needs a, a new type of instrument, a new kind of technology that represents our culture. So we are interested in this question, how we can create arts and music that doesn't necessarily have one cultural center and that therapists and facilitators can work with in their own ways. I'm going to leave it here again for all those things of interest. You can visit our website. Thank you, Marie, and everyone else for inviting me. And I'm sorry to go a few minutes over time. Um, again, I'm on Twitter. We are on Twitter. You can look at our website. And I think there is a Q&A as well. So if any one of you has more questions to, to ask, please, please do. Um, really a pleasure to be here. Thanks again for the invitation, Maria, and everyone else. Thank you very much, uh, Mendel. Uh, very fascinating uh, work. I relate to many of the concepts you are, you are exploring. Um, so now from Mendel Skellen and his sound focus experiences to the immersive installations of Rachel Winfield. I'm delighted to introduce you to our second speaker. Rachel Winfield is a founder and creative director of the spatial laboratory Loop PH and also the wellness studio Soma Lab in London, which are focused on creating transformative and immersive experiences in public spaces. Her presentation is going to focus on virtual immersive sleep meditation and other areas of therapeutic and restorative artwork. Let's all welcome Rachel Winfield.
Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure if you really heard, heard any of the sound to that. Um, anyway, thank you so much, Maria, for inviting me to this wonderful um, meeting of uh, like-minded people. Um, it's such a great context. Um, I've only ever really used Zoom for therapy so far, so I'm, I'm concerned that I don't like sit here and weep or become too uh, personal and emotional. Um, but yeah, I guess the virus has brought many um, comfortable uh, situations and calls to authenticity, so I hope I don't uh, yeah, overshare. But I would like to share my journey of transformation over this very quick 10-minute uh, 10 10 minute journey. Um, so I'm, a, I'm an artist I'm a, and I'm a designer um, of immersive experiences and environments. Um, and I've been talking about transformation and change for, for many years. So I'm really happy to be here in this context in a place where I feel like I belong. Um, and I founded the uh, London-based Spatial Laboratory um, back in oh, 2003, together with the, the Austrian artist uh, Matthias Gmachel. Um, and we really operated across the fields of um, art, architecture and the sciences uh, to transform public space. And we developed a whole bunch of uh, collaborative tools for public engagement and multidisciplinary practices. Um, our work has always been very transdisciplinary and we've collaborated with some incredible scientists and developed tools in order to enable those conversations to happen. Um, so we've, um, what, we've, what we were doing as a studio and also myself as an artist now is um, really looking at how we can create playgrounds in, in public space um, for collective experiences and collective dreaming so that we can co-create um, very radical and light-footed visions for living on this planet. Um, over the years, we've been commissioned by um, quite big brands, agencies, landowners to revitalize public space. Um, but I guess the question that I would like to pose today and I'm interested in is uh, what is the role of the artist today? Um, and I guess whose, whose stories are we, are we telling when we're commissioned by these brands and the wealthy elite and the landowners? Um, so I'm very interested in um, the, role of, the role of stories and storytelling and narratives um, in experience design. Um, and also the importance of an embodied experience. So we work a lot with technology, um, but, but, but where does our body and our senses fit, fit, fit into this? Um, and how can we use this to sort of catalyze ch change and, and transformation? Um, I'm just gonna quickly show you this image because I'm giving this personal journey and I realize I'm already two minutes in. Um, this was an installation from Loop BH. I think it was in 2014 um, at Amsterdam, the light festival. Um, we've, we've, we've embodied a lot of the work. We've, been, we've created very large scale, um, architectural scale installations. We created them by hand with teams of people. Um, and we took a very biomimetic bio approach. And we were very much inspired by the way um, ants would build their colonies. And we developed whole methodologies around this. Um, but this piece in uh, 2014 was, uh, was gigantic. It was nine meter tall. Um, Here's some statistics for you. It's hand woven with 10,000 circles, very, very tall, it's a huge piece. We worked together as a team of people, and there's a lot of technology and, and ideas that went behind it. But essentially, this piece of work um, collapsed, and um, unfortunately, so, so did I. Um, and um, sort of working as an artist, um, building these very large public installations. Um, it came a point where we had to sort of really sort of evaluate um, our own sense of wellness, mental well-being, physical. Um, and so I've really started reassessing sort of the work, work life balance, mental health, physical health. Um, and, you know, Loop is now closing and I'm starting a new, a new chapter um, called Soma Lab. Um, and really what I've done is I've, um, I, I did have an image which showed you the before and after of, of the studio. Um, but really it's become a space for quiet, for contemplation, meditation, and really looking at um, sort of a sense of building, building a community. So I've opened my art studio, I've got rid of everything that's in it, uh, and I've opened the doors so people can come now and learn various skills and techniques um, around embodiment, meditation, movement. Um, so it's been a big, you know, a very big uh, journey. Um, and over the years, this, this notion of change agency and change and um, trying to facilitate change uh, in a collective public sense has been like absolutely critical to everything that I've been doing. Um, and this notion of, yeah, of transformation. Um, so I'm going to share a few projects with you 
very quickly, um, which talk about how we've sort of looked at that on a collective sense in public spaces. So, I mean, our identities and, and sense of self are really shaped by the experiences that we undergo in life. And I really, truly believe from my own experience that the arts has this huge capacity uh, for profound life-changing experiences. Um, and I have been working for many years with this notion of light, sound, and I just added now the word experience as medicine. Um, these, these qualities really as medicine and looking at the therapeutic qualities that they can have on people. Um, and I've developed this, um, this, this, this terminology which is called uh, restorative placemaking and it's really looking at how we can create environments very much in very busy public spaces where people can stop, pause, reflect um, and have moments where they can uh, look inwards. Um, yeah. So this is an example here um, of, 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 of that very, uh, very approach. Um, so this is really looking at how we can design experiences for, for collective, collective wellness and really looking at kind of mental health actually and how modern society is absolutely um, on the go all the time. There's no place to pause, we can't stop, we're always switched on, There's always, we're always connected to our phones. Um, so this is a project called The Canarium and it was commissioned by um, Manchester Science Festival. And uh, this is an image of the Manchester Arndale Centre. And we basically built this huge structure inside um, and it became a sleep lab. So we collaborated with um, a whole bunch of sleep scientists, neuroscientists, and really were looking at the science of sleep. Um, and we found a, a way to sort of um, try to connect the, these, re these scientific researchers with the public um, so people could ask questions, um, look at their sort of sleep patterns, uh, and basically have this platform um, for both scientists and the public to engage with these ideas. Um, but basically what we were doing is we basically hung 16 people in these spaces. People could come into the shopping centre um, and they would be suspended in these textile hammocks. Um, and then we were looking at how the environment could be used as a, uh, as in a kind of an entrainment um, so they could sink um, that we'd go through like a color, different color pattern, color schemes, and also really looking at a sound program uh, where people would shift their brain states from um, being very alert into sort of more meditative, meditative and relaxive states of being. Um, and we were looking at different EEG, we were like different ways of measuring this as well. I'll talk a little bit more at the end because I've just recently done a project, again, looking at sleep um, in the studio and I'm gonna share like a two minute video kind of at, at the end of that. So um, what I kind of want to talk about a little bit is this notion of um, engineering, engineering empathy and looking at um, our relationship with natural environments. Um, I've been working as an artist looking at taking ecological paradigms and then applying that um, to design education and developing design processes around adaptiveness, abundance, diversity, uh, emergence and, and, and ideas around seeding and transforming. Um, so I'm really looking at how we can potentially use the arts um, to heal it's my time for my son to go to bed um, basically looking at how the arts can heal our relationship with nature um, and I think like there's this issue uh, and this notion of the story of separation which is this obviously this idea that humans are very separate from and beyond nature and not really a part of it um, so I'm kind of looking at how we can create uh, experiences which kind of can try and um, develop interspecial empathy and um, allow us to um, reconnect. So this is a project that was called uh, the Polinarium and it's the immersive experience that was presented a couple of years ago. It's a collaboration with um, Carl Smith and Mark Ransley um, commissioned in, in York and it's basically a living laboratory uh, that was in York Art Gallery and we were trying to recreate the experience of a, of a pollinating insect um, and we used all sorts of um, you know mixed reality technologies and it was this very physical uh, very physical space and we have some images so it was this huge inflatable structure that people were able to enter and we had these projection systems were in there and we we're just really looking at if, if you could if you could start to change your sensory system and experience the world as if you were a bee for instance being drawn to a flower um, if you can start to play with these I you know play with these notions of scale and different experiences you know are we able to then develop uh, a different connection with these other species and different ways of uh, different ways of living Um, 
I'm just going to shoot back there. So, um, yeah, one of the really important um, narratives uh, and components of the work is, is just really looking at like storytellers and who are our storytellers. I mean, our whole world is built on telling stories. And I think what sets us apart from other species is our ability to tell stories. Um, and they explain who and why and what things have happened. And I think we need to really understand the impact that stories have had on our, had on our lives. Um, and I really like this quote by the, the author Ben Oakry, that we need to be aware of the stories you read or tell because subtly at night beneath the waters of consciousness, they're altering our worlds. Um, so one of the tools that I've been using um, in terms of transformative design as a design probe is like looking at films and sets that really play and explore different narratives. Um, so many dystopian visions of the future, which we can see like science fiction and pop culture, I think they really limit people's abilities to imagine much more positive um, versions um, and act differently. So yeah, really looking at how we can create um, a much more optimistic and ambitious and engaged conversation about the future. So um, I think right at the beginning, you saw a video of a piece called Osmo. Um, I'm going to shoot on because we're running out of time. And um, basically, this piece was um, very, very low tech. But the idea is that it was an inflatable Faraday cage that could be put up in parts of the city where we can't see the night sky anymore. Um, and the idea really was that it would create this bubble that cut us off from um, the internet and the Wi-Fi and um, EMF sig signals um, because I think we need to really look at how the city offers um, parks and restorative spaces uh, maybe we don't want to be connected all the time maybe we need spaces where we can completely disconnect um, and sit and still and have a place where we can uh, connect with each other again and tell stories and I think this is yeah going to become more and more important um, and this piece has toured and traveled and, and, and basically been inflated at like, conferences like TED um, where it, we, it's hosted all sorts of discussions and conversations where we've sort of pointed at the stars in perhaps the ways that we used to do. I'm, I'm going to speak much more quickly now because I know that I'm kind of running out of time, but this was um, one of the last projects that, um, that I conceived at, at Loop um, when I was creative director there, and it was, a, it was at the Design Museum um, in London. And um, this was called the, um, the mind, mind Pilot. And basically, uh, it was a project really looking at um, brain entrainment, meditation practices, and looking at how um, through um, observing and learning from our environment, we can learn to get into meditative states. Um, so this was a, a huge helium-filled hot air balloon that, was, that floated and moved um, throughout the atrium of the design museum. Um, and uh, we would have a single visitor that would come and they'd be suspended in this hammock and they would go through a, a VR program that basically allowed them to fly out of the, uh, out of the design museum um, in this quite calming meditative state. And the, the calmer that they beca became, um, the higher that they would fl fly and the higher that this balloon would actually flow. So it's really looking at how we could link um, very physical things within our environment. Uh, this is the last project I'm just going to talk a little bit about, which is um, uh, a quite an important project for me, which is called the Horticultural Spa, um, which was a very physical, immersive experience, which looked at water scarcity um, and how you could create this, again, this bubble on the Thames, uh, looking, um, re basically rethinking the public bath um, and inviting people into this space and um, with minimal, minimal use of water. So the whole place was filled with um, this aromatic fog, um, medicinal fog. We had um, yoga teachers, meditation teachers, which would come and facilitate these spaces. Um, so we've been working a lot with um, practitioners who can facilitate these environments. Um, so great, so I'm gonna move on to the last, um, last project, which is again, looking at sleep and restoration. And this was um, a very recent collaboration um, with Leo Kassendai, um, who's a sound meditation teacher. Um, and we were looking at really how we could translate some of this work into a, into a virtual, virtual environment. And it's gonna be something we're gonna be doing a lot, a lot more of and looking how we can share these experiences um, um, online. Um, I, I mean, sleep is such a, a huge issue. I mean, I, I suffer from sleep problems myself. It's becoming much more of a, a, 
of a, of a modern modern day problem. So this is a, a meditation program uh, that was filmed in the studio um, where I am using sort of binaural recording, um, using uh, Leo's very traditional ancient instruments um, within a, a lightscape which I designed, which basically kind of ran through the, the Kelvin scale. Um, and it was, a, it, was a, it was an incredible experience to actually kind of be there and invite people into that space um, as well. And I sort of developed these light orbs um, and essentially they're, um, they're breath entrainment devices. So you might see a very small clip of the film now if there is enough time, but really looking at how um, lighting and um, uh, atmospheres and things within our physical environment could become um, Kind of entrainment devices so this this light will pulse and, and help guide your breath so moving beyond the screen so the idea with this film is that you don't watch it in a traditional sense um but it um you can almost watch it with your eyes closed and you allow the the pulsing light to um, to kind of guide your breath so i'm gonna i'm gonna pause now because i've really i'm aware that i've uh, run out of time um there's a lot more that I could be saying, so I welcome any questions at the end. So if you have headphones on, hopefully you can hear a little bit of, um, of what Leah was doing um, in this session. And um, yes, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, um, Rachel. Your um, art pieces are a big inspiration and your approach to well-being is uh, really, really unique. And now from the um, immersive um, installations uh, from um, Rachel Winfield to the transcendental media performative experiences from Kimatica. Kimatica Studio explores the intersection between the human body, life performance, and interactive technology to create transformative experiences that seek to dissolve the boundaries between illusion and reality. This evening, I will share some of the relevant projects from Kimatica, where I'm the creative director and concept artist. Kimatica combines light, motion, and emotion, exploring the limits of human perception. 
We research the crossroad between light, sound, and movement, in which the human body becomes a link between the three, overlapping physical and virtual layers in order to create rich and mental realities. We are committed to use our creative vision to help develop artistic experiences that can benefit the entire community. We've done several projects with the London charity Torres Hero, working with neurodiverse people, and we are constantly striving to develop new ways of integrating our creative and social vision. We also work closely with fellow researchers from different universities to find new ways in which scientific research can inform our experiences. Now, I would like to share a few short teaser videos from our past projects that relate most to levitations. I would like to start by simulacrum. I've always seen art as a catarchine and sublime experiences, with many similarities with the religious, shamanic, and spiritual experience, as seen by Mark Levy in his book Technicians of Ecstasy, where he explored the relationship between shamanism and contemporary artists such as Joseph Bouillot, Van Gogh, Turner, and many others. Simulacrum was created in 2012 from this interconnection, and it was our first performance aiming to have a transformative effect on the audience and the performer. It was also exploring new types of contemporary rituals that could connect with our Western society. Nestor Rubio, Kimatica software artist, created the first version of our body tracking software for this piece. This tracking technology allows us to use the information obtained by computer vision analysis as input for the algorithms that generate the visuals affected by the performance movement in real time. This technique allows us to push the limits of visual perception aiming to transport the viewer into the subconscious dimension. Now, I would like to show you a short video of our performative installation, Relax and Release. We created Relax and Release for Tate Museum in 2016, an interactive digital installation that, that encourages movement and play, helping the audience to reconnect with the physical bodies. The ultimate objective is to reconnect with the emotional and abstract aspects of the human body and mind, facilitating exploration of the body's movement without constraints or directions. We also use our body mapping technology here, which rewards interactivity between the audience. The more people interact, the more visual reward they will have. The visual outcome of this piece is entirely created by audience interaction, allowing them to take direct part in the creation of the art piece. 
Last year, we were commissioned by British Council to create a new iteration of this piece, and that was the video that you just seen. We collaborated with sound artist Magic Dot to develop an interactive 3D sound software to be synced with our visuals interactive system. This piece offers a meditative space for the audience to reconnect with the physical bodies, bodies encouraging a collective participatory experience too. Now, I would like to show you our last video from our latest performance, Transcendence. Transcendent is a multidisciplinary practice-based research art piece exploring how performance art in combination with interactive technology can induce an altered state of consciousness. It takes its audience into a, into a multisensory immersive journey through the subconscious mind by manipulating perception combining interactive technology like such as lighting of visuals, 3D uh, sound, physical performance, dance trance, live vocals, mantras, character designs, wearables and essence. With a team of psychologists, neurologists, technologists, performance artists, and other visual designers, Transcendent is an interdisciplinary project that approaches uncertain terrain both in science and performance. This piece has been showcased at Greenwich University, Rich, Mix Theater, and Watermath Sound Center, to name a few. Last year, I wrote an academic paper about this research, which has been published at EVA and Breaking Convention Conference. The research of this piece continues, and we are currently putting together a team for our next iteration. Now, from the transcendental performative experiences of Kimatica to the multisensorial and now neurodiverse work of Natasha Trotman. Natasha Trotman is an inclusive designer and researcher whose work focuses on mental differences and neurodiversity as a way to foster new conversation and approaches to the world around us. Her presentation will explore extending the frontiers of knowledge around mental differences and marginalized experiences, in addition to also reframing mainstream notions of equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion through an intersectional, intersectional design lens. Let's all welcome Natasha Trotman. Hello, Maria. Thank you. It's, it's really good to be here to share my practice with you all. Okay, so um, as you know, I'm an inclusive designer and researcher, and I'm currently an artist in residence at Somerset House, Studio 48. So we shall begin the presentation. Okay. My work focuses on mental difference and neurodiversity as a way to foster new conversations and new approaches to the world around us. Neurodivergent refers to those whose experience and process of the world are distinct and unique due to neurological differences. Um, this includes, but not limited to, autism, dyslexia, dyspraxia, 
learning disabilities, Tourette's, ADHD and adverse childhood experiences. The term mental difference will be used also as this includes persons living with a dementia. But before I go on, let's do a tiny bit of jargon busting first. So what is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is a relatively new term created in 1998 by sociologist Judy Singer. Um, many people may not know who she is, um, but learning more about neurodiversity and taking steps to better support those in everyday settings can be hugely beneficial for persons that are within this group, as well as the wider community. Learning about lived experiences can be transformative. So, as I mentioned before, it's all about equitable engagement, inclusivity, neurodiversity. My work examines different ways of experiencing and processing the world from people with a mental difference, hidden disabilities, neurodivergent communities, such as dyspraxic and autistic persons, through to people living with a dementia. I also work with neurotypical people. Okay, so why do I do what I do? Simply, good design enables, Ad design disables. Whilst working across my projects, I started to realize that not every voice is being heard. This led to me having a strong resonance with the social model of disability. This underpins my work. I also have many hats. Two of those, you know, you're already aware of them. You can already guess. So I'm a designer and researcher. I'm also neurodivergent, a woman, I'm black, and I'm an SEND practitioner. As we're aware, there's one geographical world. However, there are many worlds within worlds that many people are living right across from you. So I draw down on my various skills, lived and learned experiences when needed to traverse these various spaces with the aim of illuminating unheard and underserved voices and mapping out better futures through articulated outputs. What's woven through my work is curiosity, intellectual humility, passion, convergence. These aspects have taken me on an explorative journey through specialisms, neurotypes, and communities. One of my aims and hopes is to provide inspiration through my practice and break down barriers, providing encouragement to my neurodivergent siblings and cognitive cousins of today and tomorrow and to hopefully demonstrate that ambition and adding value in your own unique way is possible regardless of ability or impairment. What you can see here is the Tune In Tune Out project. It's a multimodal toolkit born out of my project Tangible Statistics Linguistics. It's an umbrella project focusing on creating an awareness tool, something that allows the users to experience dyspraxic traits in this project. I shape interventions to foster empathy, agency, and awareness concerning dyspraxia. One of the articulated outputs within the toolkit was neurodivergent jewelry, as you can see in the image. This helped build momentum for creating new offerings that sought to harness lived experiences and foster learning for sustainable change. Tangible Statistics Linguistics and Alt Experiences, another umbrella project I will speak about later in the presentation, are examples of the interactive umbrella projects that I work on and within my practice that aim to harness empathy, agency and awareness concerning and centering neurodivergence, divergent neurotypes through autoethnography, provocations and interactive mixed methods, including analog and digital interactions. What you can see here is uh, an interaction that's both analog and digital. It's physical and it's smart and it glorifies and rewards error based on dyspraxic traits. So when my curiosity and passion comes into play, I reach out to communities to create dialogues that can often go beyond linguistics. What that looks like is collective poetry, co-authoring papers, 
and inventions to create responses and bridge gaps, challenges to which solutions didn't currently exist or were not widely known, enabling new methods, approaches and engagements to be of service to all within society and coin what underpins my approaches and methods as a force for nurture. I believe finding new ways to innovate within design and agile cross-sector collaborations are vital so that all within society can be part of a new, inclusive, creative economy and exchange system where the needs and values of a nurtured society can be reflected in the design offerings and engagements people see, experience, access and use, transforming pain points into positive collective experiences. These images are part of the Alt Experiences Umbrella Project. This is a project which explores non-normative ways of being by a multimodal experimental play, <laughs> focusing on creating, exploring various tools and provocations, providing opportunities for participants to consider and in some instances immerse themselves in non-typical ways of being via experience interventions. And what you can see in the lower right hand corner is an experience intervention um, for a, a national gallery late involving remixing the data in your space and that involves tactile signing and making colours heard. Curiosity, intellectual humility and convergence coupled with a passion for inclusion for all has led to my creating various sensory workshops and exhibits cultural institutions and organisations, including the v &A, the London Design Biennale, Somerset House, the National Gallery and Tate Britain, to name a few. This image shows one of the projects I worked on recently. It's a research project, which I was the researcher for, with Wellcome Trust and the Royal College of Arts Helen Hamlin Centre. And this project is called Design in the Mind. The project focused on the joint creation and engagement with neurodiverse groups and neurodivergent, non-typical individuals. The aim was enabling Welcome to improve its approach to inclusivity by addressing issues surrounding cognitive, physical and digital access to the Welcome Collection Hub, a transdisciplinary research space, and its resources for a variety of users. This involved looking at the ways in which Welcome engages and co-creates with neurodiverse audiences with a focus on collaboration, research and public engagement. The toolkit seeks to complement and build on the emergent and expanding inclusive offerings at Welcome. The image that you can see are some of the articulated outputs. I was recently commissioned to create a short film as part of Somerset House's hyperfunctional ultra healthy program. Now this film explores, it's called Subset Reset and it explores non-normative perceptions and experiences of the everyday, the trials, triumphs, challenges through the contributions of its participants who have each worked with me to develop a verse of the narration. The film invites audiences to consider non-normative lived experiences and ways of being, turning lived experiences into learned experiences and it will play shortly. Nonlinear. Nonlinear. present future tick tock tick tock tick tock back to back we face each other back to back we face each other back to back we face each other non-linear cycles rhythms spoons move cycles rhythms spoons move cycles rhythms spoons move back to back we face each other past present future 
cognitive siblings, spiritual cousins, past, present, future. Back to back, we face each other, past, present, future, non-linear. Butterfly kisses, rapidly blinking my eyes against, against the, the tide. tide, existence and events, quantifying, quantifying rates, rates of change. change, quantities, material reality, all tools, tools for mediating challenges, proximity, clarity, clarity balancing in human, human form. My, my name is So little and so much of it. The sounds fill up, spill out, hardly in numbers. Neo diversions and non numbers. Cousins, siblings, social justice, inclusive transitions. Chronos waits for no one. Onward, Onward with the mission. My name is. Non-linear, fluid interactions with fractals, fractions, time-based, social acrobatics to meet the mainstream satisfaction. It's not one size fits all. Tick, tock, fracture. My name is... Past, present, future. Tick tock, tick tock, Okay, thank you. So, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, one of my aims and hopes is to provide inspiration through my practice, breaking down barriers and providing encouragement to my neurodivergent siblings and cognitive cousins of today and tomorrow, as we all have a shared stake in this. I hope my practice demonstrates to my fellow neurodivergent and the neurodiverse ambition and adding value in your own unique way is possible regardless of ability or impairment. My proposition to cognitive specialists who would like to contribute to a more equitable future, more equitable futures for us to map them out for ourselves, for all, is to consider what the data set of COVID, the uptick of COVID would feel like, should it be designed as a non-linguistic interaction. Thank you. And I can be contacted at Trotikin. Thank you very much, much uh, Natasha. Like really, really, really inspirational uh, work. I think you're bringing uh, some very important points about inclusivity and, um, and yeah, how uh, we have to approach um, well-being, the future of well-being from, from a neurodiverse uh, uh, approach too. So thank you. So now from the multisensory and neurodiverse work of Natasha Trotman to the art life based experiences of Luciana Hay. Luciana creates artworks that explore altered state of consciousness and focus on sleep, lucid dreaming, memory and nostalgia. She pioneered the use of brainwave monitoring and her performance demonstration is adapted from the, from the front stereo, an experience in letting go and receiving insight and more flow. I wanted, before I leave you with her, I wanted to mention she will be using some strobe lights on her demo. Let's all welcome Luciana Hale. Hello everyone. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, thank you, Maria, for the introduction. 
Um, I first met Maria, in fact, in 2014 at the Connecticut Art Fair in the Truman Buildings in London. And it was quite a, a time where a lot changed for us. So our work both accelerated, we widened our audiences, and um, we often worked in similar environments over the next few years. I was showing a dream machine at the time, and you were doing video mapping. My work intersects uh, new technology, creativity, and my research, particularly into dreaming uh, and the unconscious, I try to make mental processes visible, in particular, sleep meditation and I'm I'm kind of trying to work on something with nostalgia but it's not quite apparent yet. Um, I measure the brain waves just from the frontal lobe so I'm not working in a clinical medical environment. I have my own equipment. In fact I developed it in the last few years and these are some of the places I've been involved with over the last few years. Um, also work with Maria at Breaking Convention and some of the uh, journals and places my work has been written about. And I've been kindly supported by the Arts Council a few times now for my work. And I have been helped by companies like Subpack, which I will show you in a second. Obviously, we can't hear it, but um, Pandora Star and various companies have been so kind to help me with their equipment to show my installations over the years. But I had to make one piece of equipment, that's the brain machine. I took on a design that was from the 90s and we brought it up to date in 2016 only for a few years. It was quite tricky and it's quite hard commercially to make a profit doing this kind of thing. But uh, I enjoyed the challenge. I had a small team doing this for me in Poole in Bournemouth and the company is called Brain Machine. We're still trading. We just, just don't currently have anything in stock. I've also worked as a neurofeedback therapist and that's for the company at the bottom there, Brainworks Neurotherapy. So that allowed me to deepen my understanding of uh, translating brainwaves using industry standard software like Loretta and Z scores and measuring 20 placements, um, mainly to help people de-stress for a private company. So now I'm going to play the first video, which is actually of the brainwave analysis that I use. What's really important about what we could see there is the very high peak in the alpha frequency. So my work particularly entrains brain waves um, using lights. So here uh, I'm at work at the Royal Academy. We've got the dream machine behind in front of me with the UD audience and I'm applying the electrodes to this person. She's having her brain waves monitored whilst she keeps her eyes closed. So this is an artwork that is designed to the experience behind closed eyes and actually invented by an artist in the 60s called Brian Giesen with a mathematician Ian Somerville and I've published on that. I'm very interested in the pioneers and all the people behind everything that I use. So in this piece, the front of Stereon, which Maria proudly introduced, uh, it's a combination of brain waves driving sound, which is fed back to you whilst you're in a dentist chair in front of a dream machine. Um, it's been described and I, I was very intrigued by this myself as a modern form of portraiture. So it's, it's quite futuristic, uh, capturing sort of private information about somebody and showing it though to on a projection screen or across an entire installation to the general public. I must point out that any data is never saved or shared. So I'm, I'm also very concerned about the ethics of working with the EEG signal, the brain waves, and just using that in, a, in an unprofessional way. So everything is signed off and I actually have a disclaimer from each participant to agree that they're okay with the light and also with me briefly saving the file whilst we're in the recording session. So I'm very interested in surrealism and bringing it up to date. Surrealists obviously were mainly informed by Freudian analysis in the 30s and the 40s 
And if we think about the artists in the scene we're talking about tonight that I'm, I'm so uh, lucky to be involved with, we're all informed by neuroscience. So it's replaced uh, the kind of psycho psychology, but not totally because there's a lot of psychedelic therapy going on and breaking convention brings that together. So just a slide here, Dali invented a technique which I'm, I employ a lot to help people relax, slumber with a key. You just fall asleep with a key in your hand and something noisy underneath. And as the key hits the noisy thing, you wake up. So you get a power nap, you don't really get a sleep. But what you enter is that lightly hypnagogic state that my work is very much about. Alvin Lucia was the first artist in the 60s to pioneer brainwave monitoring his work. No time to talk about him now, sadly. There's Brian Geisen with a dream machine, looking into it with his eyes closed. And here is Roy Ascot, my professor from Newport, Wales, who I studied with in the 90s, who also taught Brian Eno, um, Pete Townsend, Stephen Willets, and he really showed us how to process over product. We studied cyberneticians and alternate ways to connect to an audience. Roy Ascot really appealed to us to uh, engage total spectator participation. And I'd like to think I'm doing okay with that in my work, as in I always bring the audience in more than myself being a performer. This is a painting that I engage with every time in the National Gallery, particularly because the eyes of the Benedictine nun were given, were given to her because she recovered her sight. And my name, Luciano, is connected to the Latin for Luce, which is she lost her sight. So moving through quickly now, so this, I've worked for the Scientific Medical Network showing my art and I created um, a kind of product version. I call it Ecstasis. It means to step outside of yourself and you get to experience the Pandora star, which is like the modern kind of digital uh, light emitting entrainment device with a sub pack and uh, the sub pack would be worn on the body. It's this sort of size. It's a speaker you put on your back and um, the whole experience is behind closed eyes. And we've got a little video coming up now after this slide. So I've got something literally wrapped up because they may be there for 15, 20 minutes. So there's a foil to keep them warm. So if we go to the video now, I'll stop sharing. Okay. Um, I think I'm back on the screen now. Okay. So what do people see? So there's one thing there's that the, they are the participants in the chair, one at a time, waiting to have their experience. Other people are watching the output. The person in the chair with her eyes closed, wearing the EEG, she's seeing a mixture of entoptic patterns, symbolic imagery. Um, they're also described as um, physio form constants, shadow patterns. Um, and these are occurring in the sort of retinal processing part of the brain. And there's a kind of shared language of them. So we can look at these patterns um, as, a, as a sort of symbolic language of Catherine Wheels, spider webs and so on. Here is a, 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 an installation. I'd love to show you this clip more than any of the others before we do the performance work. Uh, this was a collaboration with Sam Wheel in Liverpool in the Psychedelic Festival, Music and Arts Psychedelic Festival, where we combined VDMX, brain waves, uh, live music, participants. And um, this is the video for this one. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Um, yeah, so most of my work is basically unusually for an artist's experience behind closed eyes. So therefore there's a lot of interviewing involved and I know I'm getting close to my time. Um, the interviewing involves, I have an assistant who will help 
and get uh, the, the information from each person um, a very well guided how was your experience have you ever had anything like this before could you compare it to anything and then if possible they want to draw if we could just play this video please Yeah, so really short that one because that's just unusually <laughs> a double a double dream machine, a double a stereo, almost peripheral vision. So I was experimenting there and that was in Holland and giving feedback from people. So let's go next slide. As I mentioned, I often have the setup as an artist, both with like a kind of treatment area and then a post kind of processing area, almost a, a decompression space where you will be interviewed by generally my lovely assistant, Rosie and she will spend sort of 15 minutes or so with you. So I don't like to rush people through. You're just a kind of visitor. Um, these are the sort of things we've had left as well as written um, and very, very illustrative verbal feedback. Uh, really passionate about energy moving. Uh, my body seemed to leave myself. Have I ever had anyone have an ag reaction? Yes, once or twice. And I have to be trained to be prepared for that because as an artist, I'm totally responsible for this person, but I'm not giving them a treatment. I'm giving them an experience that's a kind of endogenous, drugless high. And therefore, I, I want to look after them. Um, we collect these, and these are generally kept private. They're the classic Jan Perkin Yars kind of entoptic patterns, which I normally show in my longer talks. Uh, they're the entoptic forms. I am getting to the last slide because I'd like to show you now, and I'd like to explain that this final video you're going to see. Uh, is a live performance I made at the weekend that would be how we would normally meet. You know, if we were in a space together, you would be in the installation. So everything you're about to see, the brain waves are driving the samples and the sounds. I've kind of loaded up a composition with my samples and my video clips, and then my brain waves as I get entrained by the flickering light, which is flashing at eight to 12 times a second, my brain ideally goes into the similar state of alpha or theta brain waves. And I think you'll see that in the last minute or so, there is a change. Um, this is an experience that normally goes on a lot longer. So I appreciate we've had a, a bit of a quick version of this tonight and maybe there'll be some questions afterwards or in the chat. So thank you. If we could go to the final slide, which is my performance for four minutes. Thank you. An occasion made me all honeycombs, all honeycombs, all honeycombs, all honeycombs, Oh. Okay. 
Thank you. Normally when I do this, we would be using this brainwave monitor. And this is the device that I was showing you earlier. And of course, here we have the dream machine. Thank you very much, Luciana. Really inspirational work. You've been, an, you've been an inspiration for many years now, and it's really good to see uh, yeah, all the progress uh, that you've been uh, doing in the last few years too. I hope you all have enjoyed the journey we have taken you on to explore, to explore the different possibilities that are being researched for the future of well-being. I'm afraid we ran out of time to do the Q&A live session, but we've been answering questions via the chat. So if you have any, um, uh, any other questions, you can, write them uh, quickly in the chat. Otherwise, you can always uh, contact uh, all the uh, speakers directly. As all their links, they've been, been shared in the, in the chat too. Also remember that there will be a video uh, of this uh, talk um, uh, at the National Gallery uh, website. Thank you so much to all the speakers. Mendel Kellen, Rachel Winfield, Natasha Trotman, and Luciana Hale, to the FLAX team, Afra Shemsa, and Oliver Gingrich, and also to the National Gallery team, Christopher Riopel, Ali Hossein, Irum Ali, Chris Michaels, and Ian Warren. With limitations, I wanted to highlight the possibilities of transformative therapies that are being explored today, aiming that this can, that this can help us to levitate into a better future. I also wanted to expand on the role that immersive technologies should have in our contemporary society in order to address the deepest of individual and societal needs. We'd like for this event to serve as a starting point to research how collectively we can develop suitable new therapy, therapies for all. My research on this theme will continue with new events planned for next year, and I will be exploring how this type of events also can be complemented with participatory workshops where we can test these ideas with more practical activities. Do stay in touch also with our Art in Flux by joining our newsletter via our website, where you can find more about our, about, for, about our upcoming events. And if you are a media artist, do write us an email as we do host our regular uh, FLAX uh, socials, where we always welcome new artists. Now, I would like to pass it on to Ali Hussein and Afra Semsa, who are going to share some information about our upcoming events. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maria, and thank you to all the speakers for such an inspiring and relevant event. It's been absolutely brilliant. I'm delighted to announce that our next event, which I'm curating, is called Shifting Ground and will take place on the 18th of November. 
Using the National Gallery's collection as a starting point, Shifting Ground will invite a number of key media artists exploring identity, cultural heritage and migration within their work. We will consider the impact and legacy of South Asian migration and what that has had on contemporary British culture and celebrate the rich and diverse voices within the media art scene. So we do hope that you can join us for that. I'll now hand over to Ali Husseini, who will talk a little bit more about National Gallery events. Well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks very much, Afra and Maria and all the artists. This has been a, a wonderful, wonderful um, moment in time for National Gallery X. And I, first, I have to comment on what I've seen. What, what, what came to mind first was Tertullian's uh, slogan, what hath Athens to do with Jerusalem? And he said that almost 2,000 years ago and kicked off a couple millennia of dualism and alienation. And uh, National Gallery X, you know, we're looking at the history of art and where art has figured in the, the past and where art has figured in the future. And we're really still in this era of art for art's sake and science for science's sake. And uh, so Tertullian started the trend, you might say, let's blame him, and C.P. Snow summarized this by talking about the two cultures of art and science. And uh, let's think about where this program of dualism and separating art from science and the spirit from matter has gotten us. It's taken us to this period of catastrophe. And so tonight's program to me was especially poignant because now I'm at the point where every decision I make, and I think all of us are there, um, has deep consequences. Are you going to eat a bag of crisps and choke a dolphin? You know, our desires are so out of sync with our environment. So we're, we're at a critical historical juncture. And it, it's really an honor for me and for National Gallery X to share the stage with people that we have presented as artists. Uh, bravo to all of you as artists. But I'd also say that you're visionaries and you're healers. And tonight, I, I've seen what I think is some of the answer to some of the, the questions that confront us personally and existentially existentially, but also personally and ecologically in terms of this catastrophe. So we started with what we might call an artistic concept, which is immersion. But what, what does immersion mean? I, I talked about cave paintings a little bit as the original immersive art. The immersion here in this context of artists as visionaries and healers is the integration, the integration of the self with the self the integration of the self with society, and finally, the integration or reintegration of the self with nature. And, and I don't think that we're going to survive as individuals or as a species unless we can not only answer these questions, but achieve this integration, and it needs to be done experientially, as we've seen tonight. So um, I brought up the cave paintings at the beginning because art has always uh, played this role in society. I mean, we don't really know what our ancestors were thinking, but probably something like what we were thinking and the people that have shared the stage and shared their thoughts and their remarkable work with us were thinking, which is, is I want to bring us back into ourselves, reflect on ourselves, our relationships with each other and with the world. And um, today uh, we've answered another question too, I think, um, diversity is very, very important. But there's a political question about diversity versus conformism. So I think we also, the big question for us is how do we achieve um, unity without uniformity in the political sense? So thank you very much to all of you for uh, participating in this, uh, for, for contributing to it. Thank you for the audience for your great questions and the inspiration that's coming from you. Um, we worked with Art and Flux in the past, and uh, I think we'll show a slide about the Analema Group's participation in that. But tonight, you, you opened such big issues that I just encourage everybody to explore uh, the offerings at National Gallery X, 
Art and Flux and all of these individual artists. So brava uh, and bravo to, to all of you. And thank you uh, so much for participating, uh, especially to the audience who's uh, come and made this real for us. So I, I wish you a very good night.